lighthouse lamp a few feet distant shone full into my chamber and made it as bright as day. So I knew exactly how the Highland Light bore all that night, and I was in no danger of being wrecked. Unlike the last, this was as still as a summer night. I thought as I lay there half awake and half asleep, looking upward through the window of the lights above my head, how many sleepless eyes from far out on the ocean stream, mariners of all nations, spinning their yarns through the various watches of the night, were directed toward my couch. So wrote Henry David Thoreau in the mid-1800s on one of his four visits to Cape Cod Highland Light on the bluffs in Truro above the great outer beach. Thoreau, who wrote of his visits in his classic work Cape Cod, stayed in the keeper's house in the company of keeper James Small, whose grandfather in 1796 sold his land to the government for the construction of Cape Cod Light. Cape Cod Light, originally called Highland Light, was built in 1797 on a bluff in Truro, Massachusetts, overlooking the treacherous shoals of the Atlantic near the tip of Cape Cod. The original light was rebuilt twice in the 1800s. Faced with certain destruction from the encroaching Atlantic, Cape Cod Light was saved in July 1996. The 66-foot high, 420-ton light was moved inch by inch on steel rails to a site more than 550 feet from the cliff to the delight of the many people who labored to save her and those whose lives reflect her glory. There is history here. There is beauty and power and mystery here where the land meets the sea. And all of that is reflected in this light. It has shone for two centuries, and thanks to those who are here, it will shine for many centuries to come. So I congratulate all those who have been part of it. I celebrate our respect today for what this lighthouse is. Much more than a beacon, much more than a symbol. It's part of us, and thanks to you and this partnership, it will be part of us for all of future. Thank you. And it's kept here for, for our history, for us, Cape Cod. It's not just one, for one person, really, it's for everybody. It's the mother of all lights on Cape Cod. Now, not to take anything away from the rest of them, Nasset Light's very pretty light, Chatham, very pretty light, uh, Race Point, Wood End, all those lights, Nobska. But Cape Cod Light towers above all of them. The others are like little chicks around the mother. Nothing moves the imagination like a lighthouse, and nothing moves a lighthouse like imagination. This is a story about imagination, about the vision and perseverance that moved Cape Cod Highland Light. We begin with the history of lighthouses and Cape Cod Light's place among these majestic beacons of welcome and warning. Long before Christ, there were lighthouses all over the Mediterranean. The uh, Colossus of Rhodes was a lighthouse. The most famous, perhaps, was the Pharos of Alexandria, which is a 450-foot tall tower built on the island of Pharos in 200, some 280 B.C. and lasted down to 1200 A.D. Admont Clark is a lighthouse historian and author of the book Lighthouses of Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket, Their History and Lore. The book, published by Parnassus Imprints of Hyannis, provides us with a timeline of lighthouse technology. Writes Clark, nobody can say when man first conceived of using shore lights to guide seagoing vessels. The answer is buried in prehistory. Some say that Homer's Iliad mentions such lights. Virgil in his Aeneid certainly does, but some also say that the Colossus at Rhodes, built about 300 B.C., held a light in his hand. In any case, there were 18 reputed lighthouses from the Bosporus to Dover before the birth of Christ, according to D. Allen Stevenson, a famous Scottish lighthouse engineer. But the most famous of early lighthouses was the Pharos of Alexandria in Egypt, built about 280 B.C. Writes Clark, the immense stone tower was 450 feet tall. For centuries, it maintained a perpetual wood fire fed by slaves at its top. About 1200 A.D., an earthquake destroyed it. An Arab geographer who visited the site in 1150 observed that during the night, the pharaohs shined like a star, and by day you could distinguish the smoke. And so a lighthouse became known as a pharaohs. As late as 1755, a dictionary defined the word pharaohs as 
a high building at the top of which are hung lights to guide ships at sea. Wood fires were a common light source until the 1600s when candles came into use. The famous Eddystone Light in Plymouth, England, used 60 large candles in an iron framework in the late 1600s. Candles were replaced by oil lamps. In the early days, the lamps consisted of only wicks floating in a bowl of oil, often called spider lamps. Spider lamps gave off a noxious smoke that not only soiled the lantern glass, but also prevented the keeper from staying in the lantern room for long periods of time. In 1792, a Frenchman named Ami Argand invented the first major advance in lighting, a nearly smokeless lamp with a glass chimney and a reservoir for oil. The challenge was in directing the most light to the horizon. Eventually, a parabolic reflector coated with silver was used. The ultimate in light advances was the work of another Frenchman, Augustin Fresnel, who developed a lens system in the 1820s that still bears his name. The Fresnel lens was the first revolving lens. These early lenses were built up of curved prisms of glass mounted in a metal frame. The lens came in different sizes. The smallest was 11 and 3 quarters inches in diameter. The largest was a huge crystal, similar to the one installed in Cape Cod Highland Light in 1901, which stood 12 feet high with a diameter of 9 feet. It weighed 2,000 pounds and floated in a circular bed of mercury. Lighthouse technology over the years was propelled by the need to develop stronger lights from the 1600s on, particularly in the New World where lighthouses served a different function. Donald Davidson, author of the book America's Landfall, published by Peninsula Press, explains why. In the old world it goes without saying that the world was a much smaller place in terms of navigation and just civilization and, and commerce. In the old world the lighthouses were to guide people into harbors and through safe waterways. When we got to the New World, it was a whole different story. We know the pilgrims had a tough time making it to their original destination, and when they tried to surround or go around Cape Cod, the shoaly areas around Malabar and Monomoy forced them back to Provincetown. So we know how bad the landscape and how treacherous the shoals were around the Cape and Islands. And so we move even further into the New World. Once commerce began, it was merchants who built the lighthouses not to protect their ships, and not so much to protect the sailors. They could always go out and impress new sailors for a crew. It was to protect the merchandise and the commerce and the products and the cargo they had. If the history of this beach could be written from beginning to end, it would be a thrilling page in the history of commerce. So wrote Henry David Thoreau 50 years after Cape Cod Highland Light was built. Massachusetts took the lead in constructing lighthouses in colonial times, and perhaps the most exhaustive document detailing the role of Massachusetts, and more specifically Cape Cod, is an official report prepared by the U.S. Department of Interior for the relocation of Cape Cod Highland Light. Quoting from that report, the first lighthouse in the colonies, and probably the first lighthouse in the Western Hemisphere, was illuminated on Little Brewster Island at the entrance to Boston Harbor in 1716. Of the 15 lighthouses in operation in the late 1780s, seven were in Massachusetts, which then included Maine. Throughout the years, more than 40 lighthouses have been built or rebuilt on the Cape and Islands. When Massachusetts transferred custody of its lighthouses to the federal government in 1790, it represented a significant act of confidence in this fledgling national government. The construction, maintenance, and administration of lighthouses became the responsibility of the Department of the Treasury. The antecedents of the present Cape Cod Light can be traced back to a 1792 report of the Humane Society of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which warned of the necessity of having a lighthouse erected on some part of Cape Cod in order to preserve the lives and property of those who navigate the Bay of Massachusetts. In 1794, the Massachusetts Historical Society, trying to persuade Congress to construct a light, observed, the eastern shore of Truro is very dangerous for seamen. More vessels are cast away here than in any other part of the county of Barnstable. A lighthouse, should Congress think proper to erect one, would prevent many of these fatal accidents. So they wanted a, a point of reference to the New World that was between Boston and between Nantucket. And so the logical place to put it was on Cape Cod, somewhere on the peninsula. And the highest land was, on this coast, certainly the highlands of Truro. The campaign to establish a light on Cape Cod culminated on May 17, 1796, when Congress approved a bill for this purpose. 
Three months later, the federal government acquired 10 acres of farmland overlooking a 140-foot bluff in North Truro to construct the light, which would be known as both Highland Light and Cape Cod Light. Only about three acres of the original parcel is left. The North Truro land in an area called the Clay Pounds was purchased from Isaac Small, who became the first keeper of Cape Cod Light at a $150 a year salary. Lighthouse keepers' jobs were considered political plums and were appointed by the president from the time of Washington to Lincoln. The government paid Isaac Small, a prosperous farmer and miller in his day, $100 for his land and $10 for the right to cross his property to reach the lighthouse. The first light on this site was built in 1797 for $7,257. It was constructed of wood and stood 45 feet tall near the edge of the bluff. The keeper's house was a one-story wood structure measuring 25 feet by 27 feet. Small's land was appropriate by all counts. A Truro historian of the time described the parcel as uniformly the best land in town, perhaps originally in the country. The Indian name for the area, Tashmuit, is translated place of many springs. There was an ample fresh water supply on the land. The government acquired the property, wrote one official at the time, because the lands are pretty good and not so sandy as to be liable to be blown away by the high gales of wind too often experienced on this cape. Thoreau may not have agreed with the claim. Over this bare highland, the wind has full sweep. Even in July, it blows the wings over the heads of young turkeys, which do not know enough to head against it. You must hold onto the lighthouse to prevent being blown into the Atlantic. Cape Cod light was first illuminated on January 17, 1798. The first light was lit by 15 sperm whale oil burning single wick reflector lamps arranged in two semicircular tiers. These lamps held one quart of oil each and burned through the night. By the late 1820s, the wooden lighthouse had weathered severe conditions for 30 years. It was nearing the end of its useful life, and so a new brick light and keeper's house was built in 1833 on the same parcel but back from the original site. Erosion had eaten away at the bluff. Built at a lesser cost of $3,993, the second light was 35 feet high and 22 feet in diameter at its base. The keeper's dwelling, also built from brick, was a foot longer and a foot wider than the original keeper's house. Twenty years later, it was determined that yet a new light was needed. The present lighthouse and its keeper's house were built on the site of the second light in 1857. A 66-foot-high tower constructed with more than 400 tons of brick. The keeper's house was made of wood. The Fresnel lens installed at the time made it the most powerful light in New England. Pieces of the lens are on exhibit at the nearby Highland House Museum, operated by the Truro Historical Society. Today, the light's beacon shines about 180 feet above the ocean and can be seen more than 23 miles out to sea. These tall, round structures required much care, at times 24 hours a day, and that was the work of the keeper. People have to keep in mind that the keepers are very much like sailors. In fact, a lot of lighthouse keepers were at one time mariners. They understood the importance of lighthouses. They understood why they had to keep them maintained. They understood that mariners at sea were looking towards their light for some guidance and direction. Their primary responsibility came not only through the night, but also pretty much into the next morning. On stormy nights, they had to be up all night long and keep that lighthouse beacon trimmed and going as bright as possible. Especially, think back when we're talking about lanterns that burnt with wicks and keeping lanterns trimmed, or going back to candles and keeping candles burnt bright. We're talking about literally trimming wicks. And the next day, they would have to reset their lights for the following night. In other words, when, they're, when the evening was over, they would go back, trim the wicks, fill the lanterns, polish the lenses, clean the outside of the tower, those big windows. When you look at a lighthouse, don't forget, you are looking at a gigantic lantern. Think of it as a big hurricane lantern. The wick, the oil, the glass around it, protect it from the wind, sand, dirt, mud, ice, moths. Don't forget, bugs are attracted by the light. This is what a lighthouse keeper did. It was a lot of menial work. The lighthouse, 
The structural lighthouse has a very definite function to it. That deck on the outside isn't just for beauty. It isn't just to go out and look at the ships. It's to be out there and to clean down those windows and keep them clean. Architects will tell you that form follows function, that you don't build something unless there's a need for it. A school can take on any form. A hospital can take on any form. A firehouse can take on any form. They all have certain functions. Maybe a church might be the next closest thing to it. You see a steeple of a church and you know what its function is. But you look at a lighthouse and you have no doubt the reason it has that shape and that height and that color and that beacon is it's to give direction and guidance and safety. It's a safe port for people. And I think somewhere deep down inside, we all know that. We've been taught that and we recognize it as that. And so I think it's important to all of us that that's why we feel deep down inside why we want to save these lighthouses. Making a case for lighthouses are the number of ships wrecked off the outer cape since mariners started counting. I would say that in a rough estimate there's been probably between three and 4,000 wrecks and there's the hulls are interred off the backside here. The director of the United States Coast Guard Geodetic Survey suggested in 1869 that there is no other part of the world where tides of such very small rise and fall are accompanied by such strong currents running out to sea. Wrote Cape historian Henry Kittredge, it has been said that if all the wrecks were placed bow to stern, they would make a continuous wall from Chatham to Provincetown. The culprit was a treacherous sandbar off the great outer beach. Once they hit that bar, of course, uh, it breaks the back of the ship. The it's the break. sea that does it, the, it the waves. The if, you get a, if you get a heavy sea, you're going to break the ship up. Uh, as you can look in some of the pictures of my books, you'll see some ships that came ashore in calm seas, that came ashore in the fog. What the Coast Guard used to do, or the Life Saving Service, would call uh, for a tug, and the tug would show up, and they would, the Coast Guard would launch their boat, take a line from the ship out to the tug, and then when the tide was high, the tug would pull the ship off and tow her into Boston. And uh, that happened frequently uh, because there was a lot of ships that got wrecked in the fog. However, when you had a storm, uh, it was, uh, the ship was usually doomed. Ocean, the big, huge waves that come in, come in, pick up a ship, and just pick it up and smash it right out on the bar. And I mean, even a big ship can uh, stand that just so long. I think that Josephus wrecked around uh, plus or minus a few years of 1850 was the, one of the most tragic wrecks here because uh, all of the crewmen were lost and two people from the shore who launched a small boat to go out and try to rescue uh, the crew were lost. And uh, then of course you have the Jason and uh, the Portland and uh, 1896 I think the Jason was and uh, they there was a crew of 25 and they lost 24 of them. Only one man survived. And uh, she was a British ship, uh, come from India and headed for Boston with a cargo of jute. And uh, her complete crew was lost except for that one man, uh, Samuel Evans of England. The bodies washed ashore and were all interred in a s cemetery in Wellfleet. I didn't have any room for them in Turo because the cemeteries, I said, were full here. The Portland sailed from Boston in 1898 against the advice of those at port. There was a storm brewing, a blizzard with hurricane winds. But the Portland sailed anyway. On its way to Maine, it was caught in the storm and crushed by the sea. Eventually, the remains of the ship were found here in the Atlantic off Cape Cod Light. 129 souls, as they were called in the headlines of the Boston paper were, went down with the Portland, that was every person aboard. And their bodies and other items were washed up along the shore for many days afterward. Elizabeth J. Allen was the curator of the Highland House Museum for 18 years. Some of the wreckage of the Portland is on exhibit at the museum. These are some of the things that have washed up from the Portland. There is a book of poems which washed in intact and wasn't even wet because it was clasped along the edges. There are chairs here from the saloons. This was a very elegant boat, as a matter of fact, and chairs from the various saloons and, uh, and rooms in the, in the uh, ship. 
the Lifesavers had a slogan, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back, and many of them did not come back. The stern post of the Portland was caught several years ago in the nets of the churro dragger Jimmy Boy. It was authenticated by the Marine Museum in Bath, Maine. The Highland House, once a grand hotel, first opened by the Small family in 1907 and operated as a summer resort up until the late 1960s, offers not only artifacts of the wrecks, but also a detailed history of the light and its battle with the sea. These are some of the lenses from the Highland Light, which were discarded when it was electrified. Uh, they, were, they would have been arranged in a circular pattern, a bullseye pattern, and that is the reason they're curved like this. The reason they are all nicked and in bad condition is that when they were discarded from the lighthouse, they were thrown down from the top of the light onto the ground, and no care was taken with them. They weren't considered anything of value. All the residents who were anywhere near went and picked them up and saved them. And they were taken into people's homes and now have been brought back to us. The picture in 1910 shows the, the cliffs as they were then. They were uh, always eroding. Uh, at that time in the early 1900s, there was actually a stairway down to the beach so that people who visited the light or here in the hotel could, could go down to go to the beach. This picture in 1990 uh, is of a great collapse that happened uh, in the winter time and it's probably one of the instigators of saving the lighthouse because people began to realize that a, a huge part of the cliff could fall down at one time which put the light into even more danger. Cape Cod Light has had a lasting impact on those who work there and their families. Alton Hort's father, Albert, was keeper of the light from 1892 to 1904. He was on duty the night the Portland wreckage began to come ashore. The first wreckage from that, from the boat, came ashore down here off Highland Light, and that's the first time they actually knew what it, that it had gone. The life of a keeper was often a lonely, difficult existence. Practically a 24-hour job, you lived right there at the light. And uh, so you're on hand all the time, but at any time that there was any emergency, uh, you were on call. When I look at a lighthouse, I have many fond memories because I remember how devoted my father was to that business. So I always had an attachment to the location because this is a place where he actually started his career in the service, and this is the place where he met my mother, and this is the place where my brother and sister were born, so that it's... It's like an old home to me, yes. Cape Cod Light is also home to longtime churro residents Ed Rosa, former selectman Bruce Tarvers, and artist writer Joyce Johnson. Rosa's late brother was assigned to the life saving station at Highland, just up the beach from the light. The life saving service patrolled the beaches, searching for distressed vessels. In 1939, the Coast Guard took over the responsibilities of the life saving service and for maintaining all lights. Every house I've lived in Toro, including the one I live in now, I've been able to see that the beam of the light, yes. I think most of the people were proud that they, they lived in Toro where this light was and, and for the purpose that it was there. Like Rosa, Bruce Tarbers remembers the security and warmth of Cape Cod light shining in his bedroom. The light shining in the bedroom window was something that was always there and it, uh, it, it was a warm and friendly uh, appearance every night that, that uh, just flashed through the bedroom window every five seconds. Or... Artist writer Joyce Johnson has lived in Truro for 33 years. This bucolic town that is framed by the Atlantic and Cape Cod Bay attracts many artists and writers who come here to paint in its brilliant light and write in its solitude. The pilgrims themselves were once awed by Truro's beauty, most of which now lies within the boundaries of the Cape Cod National Seashore. The world today is going so fast and to me almost out of control. And those were days when everything was slower and I believe in many ways more meaningful. And we need to keep in touch with that. There are sort of anchors. We need to keep in touch. When I saw those uh, big hunks of the cliff collapsing, it was uh, obvious that if something wasn't done soon, uh, there would be a real tragedy. You would have all that brick uh, on the beach. 
Perhaps more than anyone else today, Bernie Weber exemplifies the light, its history and its grace. Weber, who now lives in Melbourne, Florida, was assigned by the Coast Guard as an assistant keeper at Cape Cod Light when he was 18. In time, he also became the officer in charge of Nauset Light, Chatham Light, and Race Point Wood End and Long Point Lights in Provincetown. Weber and three of his crewmen received the Coast Guard's Gold Medal of Valor for the brave rescue of 32 crew members from the stern of the oil tanker Pendleton in February 1952. In a profile of Weber, author John Ullman wrote in the Cape Codder newspaper that Weber faced a sea so savage it broke up two oil tankers. Weber and his crew set out in a 36-foot Coast Guard patrol boat. They lost their compass and gear, but ultimately found the Pendleton and more miraculously found their way back to Chatham Harbor. Of his years as a keeper, Weber talks of the long days and the details of his duties in the Lantern Room and also the Whistle House, an outbuilding that housed equipment to operate the light. In addition to the beacon at Cape Cod Light, Weber monitored the radio beacon that was broadcast so ships at sea could fix their position in the fog. I'd report out to the Whistle House at midnight relieve whoever was there, check the radio beacons, check the time clocks. Uh, if the fog horns were ru running, I'd check the pressure on the air compressors and make sure everything was operating fine. Make sure the light's operating fine. And I'd stand my watch for the next six hours out in the whistle house, making sure I keep everything operating. Time, timing of the equipment was of the utmost importance. The radio beacons had to sound at an exact, specific time. And they would sound out, da, da, dit, da, 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 dit, da, 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 dit, da, with a click, click in between every da, da, dit, da. And that was a shrill tone. And I, you'd listen to that and make sure that that was sounding out properly. You'd look at the clock, make sure it was sounding at the right time. It was Weber's responsibility to light Cape Cod Light a half hour before sunset and extinguish it a half hour after sunrise. But it was a simple thing to light that light. Uh, that lens, which was huge, so huge that you climbed up, went right up inside of it and you stood up inside of it. And it floated in a bed of mercury, five tons of mercury. That, that heavy lens floated in. And what drove it at that time was a little quarter horsepower motor. Very simple to get it operating. You'd go up, flip a switch, turn the light on. Then you'd grab a hold of the lens with one hand and the lever for the quarter horsepower motor with the other and you'd kind of shove and pull. And you'd get that lens to move and once it got rotating in that mercury bed, it kept on going and it was timed, it was geared inside so that, you know, it put out a, a flash every two seconds, a white flash every two seconds, could be seen 20 miles out to sea. Weber often reported to work early, to sit out on the deck at the top of the light and watch the sun rise. To go up to that tower, the top of that tower, which I think was 66 feet, then you're 120 feet above the ocean. And to be up there in the purity of it all, being able to look all the way down to Provincetown, uh, look all over the Cape, look out at the Atlantic Ocean, look out at Cape Cod Bay, and to see the sun rise above the ocean and, and come into full bloom, it's a godly experience. You'd see the world come alive, the land come to life. At that height, when the sun comes up, each tree, buildings, or whatever you're observing, all of a sudden blossom just like flowers. The Coast Guard automated Cape Cod Light in 1986, as they have done with all lighthouses in the country, with the exception of Boston Light. Tours of the lighthouses were then discontinued because no one was manning the light. The lights were automated to save money. The Coast Guard deemed the lighthouses to be obsolete because sophisticated radar could pinpoint a vessel's precise position at sea. When people began complaining at the Highland House Museum that the tours had been discontinued, Gordon Russell, vice chairman of the Truro Historical Society, and Bob Firminger, who was to become vice chairman of the Society's Committee to Save Cape Cod Light, requested a meeting with the Coast Guard. It was at this meeting that they learned of the light's dim future. 
They said, uh, we don't really think that you should be so concerned about the tours being stopped. We think you should be concerned looking ahead 25 years as to whether the lighthouse will still be there. It was the first time that it made us stop and think that we could lose the lighthouse because we knew what the rate of erosion was. And by simple arithmetic, we realized the Coast Guard was right. We would ultimately lose it within not too great a distance of time. Basically, what we learned is that the Coast Guard does not need lighthouses per se. They, could, they told us they could put up a radio type tower with a light on the top for uh, about $20,000 and they would have relatively little maintenance and no payroll whatsoever to speak of. So it was the cost of the lighthouse that, that uh, automated them. And so after meeting with the Coast Guard, Gordon Russell and Bob Firminger embarked on a six-year effort to save the light. They went to the town fathers who agreed to form a town committee to work toward preserving the light. Ultimately, the Truro Historical Society set up its own committee to allow donations to go directly to the cause of saving the light. The committee also began collecting signatures for a petition to Congress to move the light. In all, more than 140,000 signatures were obtained from all 50 states and 39 foreign countries. The interest has never ceased to flabbergast me as far as the number of people who wanted this lighthouse saved. With the town squarely behind them, Russell and Firminger met with Cape Cod National Seashore officials. The seashore owned all the land around the light, but park officials at first were not committed to saving the light. So the seashore said, we have no money, we have no plans for the lighthouse, it's not ours, it's not on our property, and we don't, it's not in our master plan, we have no plans for it whatsoever. The Coast Guard, when we went to them, they said, yes, it is ours, it will fall in the ocean, and when the time comes, since we don't need a lighthouse, we only need the light, we will dismantle it. And we have no money and no plans for it. With great perseverance, Russell, Firminger, and other Save the Light Committee members appealed to the Cape Cod National Seashore Advisory Commission, an independent board of advisors made up of prominent Cape residents. The commission agreed the light should be saved and passed its recommendation on to seashore administrators. The Save the Light Committee then appealed to Congressman Gary Stutz, who retired just two months after the light was relocated. As he has with other issues critical to the Cape, the congressman answered the call for help. The issue of moving the light was complicated by the fact that the light, as well as the adjacent Highland House and the 105-year-old Highland Golf Links, were all listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Relocation of the light had potential to disturb the other two sites, hence the light had to be surgically moved. Congressman Studs put through legislation, which went immediately through Congress and got approved by, by President Bush at the time, which mandated the Coast Guard to establish a, tr a strategy for saving the lighthouse. There was no money involved, just come up with a strategy within six months. Three possible relocation sites were then selected, all near the present site. The Coast Guard, prompted by another piece of legislation filed by Congressman Studs, anted up $600,000 for preliminary studies. Ultimately, a three-way partnership of federal, state, and local agencies was forged to raise the $1.5 million needed to relocate the light. About $900,000 was appropriated by the U.S. Coast Guard and the National Park Service. $500,000 came from the state through the efforts of the Cape State Senator Henri Rauschenbach, and $150,000 was donated by the Truro Historical Society, which will help the National Seashore maintain the light and offer tours. The bid to relocate the light was awarded to Buffalo's International Chimney Company, which successfully had moved Southeast Light on Block Island. Expert house movers of Maryland would work closely with International Chimney as they had on the Block Island move. This is truly Truro's historic district. What we want is for people to come in and be able to enjoy the whole thing. Uh, we would in, even plan on keeping the light open into the early evening hours so you'll also be able to go up the tower to enjoy the sunset or many other things because the view from up there is very, very good. For Firminger and Russell, their work was a labor of love. They were committed to saving Cape Cod light for the sake of history and for future generations. We wanted to save it because we felt 
that there was 200 years of history involved in that lighthouse and we felt it should be saved for future generations. I believe in the preservation of the old buildings. It's a part of our background, part of our history, our heritage, the, the something for our children to be proud of that their ancestors did. On Saturday, May 4th, 1996, ground was broken for the relocation of the light. Dignitaries, including Congressman Studs, Senator Kerry, and Cape Cod National Seashore Superintendent Maria Burks were on hand to mark the historic event. Uh, we are respecting history today, and unfortunately, in the nature of our political and communicative process in the world today diminishes our connection to history too much. Uh, we are respecting community today because this effort uh, grows out of uh, just plain old grassroots enthusiasm and imagination and creativity. Uh, we respect our heritage uh, and here on the Cape that is particularly important. Uh, this wonderful edifice, like so many others like it, is the same and yet different from all of its fellow lighthouses. It's an architectural stroke of genius, like the obelisks of the Egyptians that uh, points up towards the sky and connects us to God and to eternity. Uh, but at the same time, it is firmly planted here on Earth, uh, and it simultaneously points out to the ocean, uh, providing safety for those who heed its warning and for those who don't, uh, offering uh, that flashing beacon that draws them closer to the danger. Uh, there's something mysterious about that, something mystical about it. And I think that's why this is special for all of us, because we understand that mysticism, we're all connected to it, and we therefore understand even more what we are accomplishing by preserving it. Uh, really, all this hard work to save Highland was no different than the fight to get it built in the first place. Back then, the recipe was exactly as it is now. You had to have a strong need, a compelling case, a few local rabble-rousers, strong local support, and elected officials willing to fight for it. The saving of this light is more than just rescuing an historic landmark that we've all grown used to. It's more than preserving a relic of our very rich maritime heritage or preserving a tourist attraction. It is here on this spot where the federal government first made its commitment to the people of Cape Cod and those who sailed its shores that it would take on the task of saving lives. Is it, a, it is a commitment passed on to the life-saving service, those iron men and wooden boats, and it is the one that lives on today and has been entrusted to the United States Coast Guard. There is something special about a lighthouse and there is something very special about this light. It has served as a beacon of warning and a beacon of welcome. The reason this lighthouse is being saved, the reason it will be here 100 years from now, is, is not because the National Park Service stepped forward and, and took the lead. It is, in fact, because citizens of Cape Cod, citizens, folks who live right here in the Truro area, cared so much about the future of this light that you all stepped forward to rescue it. And that's why we're here today, and that's why we have so much to celebrate. And so, with the unveiling of a sign, Army Corps of Engineers project manager Joe Bocchino declared the Cape Cod Light relocation officially underway. And not a moment too soon, as the edge of the bank crept closer to the lighthouse. On behalf of the New England Division Army Corps of Engineers, I'd like to declare Highland Light on the move. Moving the corseted Cape Cod Lighthouse to a new foundation that had been poured weeks earlier took 19 days. With the skill and strategic genius of a General Patton, Merle Copeland, International Chimney Company supervisor, directed the move. He worked closely with Jerry Matico of Expert House Moving and moving consultant Pete Friesen. Using a special masonry saw, holes were cut through the walls of the lighthouse so the platform beams could be placed through the base of the light. The first two beams placed through the base were main support beams so the other beams could be positioned. After all the platform beams were in position and bolted to the main beams, the whole platform and lighthouse were jacked up and lifted onto special roll beams. Wheel jacks built onto the bottom of the main beams moved the platform along seven roll beams. The workers labored hard, in good faith and in good humor. 
That's, that's the prime objective of any job, is to go home the same way you come to work. Well, when we actually started in, we, we, base, we did basic work in the keeper's house, uh, was to go in and clear all the utilities out of the basement. Uh, the boiler had to be removed. Uh, we had to remove the stairways, hand railing, uh, everything that was in the basement itself so that we could get in there and, uh, and have the room to put cribbing in in order to move that. Cribbing is nothing but six by six oak blocking that's stacked up in a uh, manner to carry weight uh, such as a building, the beams it sits on, the beams it travels on. It's, it's a pile of wooden, wooden blocks is what it actually is. Well, we didn't do any cribbing at that point, okay? We were still in the basic preparation stage because the uh, subcontractor expert house movers did all the cribbing. So we were basically working on getting everything prepared for him to come in and, and do what he had to do. Uh, we tore the steps off of the keeper's porch. We tore the vestibule off on the uh, west side of the keeper's house. Uh, took the steps off on the east side of the keeper's house. Uh, removed all this. Uh, then we started in the lighthouse and the connector rooms by uh, breaking out the concrete floors and getting the debris out so that we could go in in and hand excavate the area to have the room to push our beams through. Uh, we also went in and removed brick on the inside of the tower and the connector building so that we could core drill through the intermediate waist of brick because we wanted to fill the uh, cavities, the bottom three and a half feet of the, the ways minimum with grout to help stabilize the tower and keep the brick from shifting. After the cavities at the base of the light were grouted and the debris was cleared, work began on sawing holes so the beams could be positioned. The beams carry the weight of the tower. They are designed to replace the earthen foundation with a steel foundation. The platform beams transmit the weight of the tower to the main beams. Wheel jacks built onto the bottom of the main beams then move the light along the seven roll beams. It's, it's not as complicated as, a, as it appears. It's just that it takes time because you're constantly looking and making sure that everything is right because you only get one chance at something like this. Uh, once that is done, then the next step of the operation was to jack the entire structure up seven and a half feet. The lighthouse was raised with hydraulic jacks that were built into the main beams and controlled by a jack machine that supplied the power to hydraulic pumps that forced the building up. Expert house movers working closely with International Chimney were now ready to go to work. When this building leaves the ground, uh, all the responsibilities are on me. Expert house movers has responsibility from the time it leaves the ground till the time it sits right here on this pad. The light had to be moved 450 feet to the west and 12 feet to the south to its new foundation. This was accomplished by maneuvering the beams to make a gradual left-hand turn. The move was further complicated by the fact that there was a 10-foot drop in elevation from the old site to the new one. Then when we came off the original site, the elevation continuously dropped. We rolled about 100 feet. We lowered it a foot. When we reset our track beams, rolled another 50 feet, we dropped two feet, and we continuously kept dropping as we moved along. There were those watching who suggested simpler ways of moving the light, suggestions that offered much appreciated comic relief. A gentleman that was standing outside the fence one day, I have no idea who he was, says, well, guy sakes, it was round. Why didn't they just lay it on its side and roll it down the hill? <laughs> Copeland opted instead to move it the old-fashioned way, one step at a time. The building was pushed in five-foot increments. It took about three hours to move 50 feet. The light was pushed by a series of hydraulic jacks linked to the jacking machine, which controlled the pressure in each jack. More than 3,000 pounds per square inch of pressure was needed to move the light. Each jack had to apply the same pressure, otherwise the foundation could have been tipped or cracked. 
you just push them, push down a handle and uh, hydraulic oil starts flowing into the five, four cylinders that were pushing the building until you've gone out your uh, five foot of travel and then it's, it's a stop. To facilitate the move, the beams were lubricated with ivory soap, much to the curiosity of those watching. The uh, ivory soap is one of the ideal things for this type of application as a lubricant because when you put weight on it, it, it packs it down, it becomes a real glassy surface and you don't have to worry about spillage problems because it's biodegradable, non-polluting. So you get it on the ground, it, it's not a problem like oils would be. After a 50-foot push was complete, the weight of the light was taken off the roll beams and transferred back to the cribbing so the roll beams could be pulled forward another 50 feet and lowered to follow the 10-foot drop in elevation. Standing next to it, it's very obvious that it was moving. You could see it with no problem. Standing 100 yards away, unless you had something fixed that you could compare them to, you couldn't tell it was moving. This graceful move was captured with dramatic time-lapse photography taken by Gene O'Connell of Tech Photo Services in Boston. As the light was moving, he shot one frame every 10 seconds on 16 millimeter film from a bluff a few hundred feet from the light. exciting moment was when it was over the pad and was being lowered down and and uh, just about the time we got it at the elevation uh, we wanted it at why I, I said to Pete that's it Pete said that's it and uh, about that time there was a flash of lightning and a clap of thunder and somebody yelled the fat lady just saying it's over with <laughs> The keeper's house was moved days later to the new site on three rubber tire dollies that were hooked to a bulldozer. The house was then rejoined to the light. The move took only five hours. There were no scratches, only a few minor cracks. For souvenirs, crew members during the light's move had put quarters under the steel rollers, flattening them into the shape of elongated pancakes. The last flattened quarter was auctioned off for $57 to a Greenwich, Connecticut couple who summered in Harwich. Moving the light was an emotional and rewarding experience for Merle Copeland, Jerry Matico, and consultant Pete Friesen. You know, everybody has a good feeling. Like I say, it's, 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 it, it'll damn near bring tears to your eyes for the simple fact that, you know, you, you've looked at this thing and uh, you started out, you know in your mind you can do it. But because of a lot of public skepticism, it, it tends to develop skepticism yourself of whether uh, you know, is, is anything going to go wrong? And when it's finished, nothing went wrong. You've accomplished what you started out to do. Uh, the building's just like it was when it started out. And that was the goal of the whole job. Moving to Cape Cod Light, it's, it's something uh, your kids can always say that uh, dad moved this place or grandkids can say my grandfather moved this place. and. It's really a good feeling to move something old that, that will be here more than 20 or 30 years. For Pete Friesen, the move was particularly challenging and special. I always described the Block Island Lighthouse as a gentle old woman, and this lady is a little bit cantankerous sometimes. <laughs> well, just little things go wrong here and there. Uh, nothing serious, but uh, just like... Uh, 
a cantankerous woman screaming at her husband. And this one wants more attention than Block Island did. But, as Friesen says, When we do things right, at the right time, everything goes right. Friesen is impressed by the history of the region and is thankful to have been part of the project. There's a lot to history. Now, when I was younger, I felt different about history. I used to say, away with the old, bring on the new. Today, I feel a little bit different, I guess, maybe because I'm older. And the location is very unique. Uh, the move is special. Well, we're saving a lighthouse. That's special. And when I first came here, I drove around uh, along Route 6. And I thought about the pilgrims from way back when. I was totally overwhelmed at the thought of it. So I'm grateful to have been able to be on this job. At a remarkable Oceanside ceremony on November 3rd, 1996, Cape Cod Light was relit. Shortly before sunset, officials and dignitaries marched to the tent for the start of the ceremony. Captain Robert Duncan, Coast Guard Group Commander for the Cape and Islands, welcomed those who braved the cold on this bone-chilling night. Welcome to the Highland Light Relighting Ceremony, at which we will bring back this fine, venerable lighthouse to life in its new location and formally transfer ownership from the United States Coast Guard to the National Park Service. In keeping with tradition, we will be relighting the light at the time of nautical twilight, which by traditional standards uh, was the time that ship's navigators fixed their position by reference to evening stars and strong beacons reaching out from the coast. The crowd was warmed by the hopeful words of Chaplain Robert Pitkin, who rededicated the light to grant all mariners who pass this way fair winds and following seas. Let us pray. Eternal Father, the psalmist once wrote, they that go down to sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of our God and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and he raiseth up the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereon. They reel and they fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at wit's end. This is the strength and the power of your awesome creation we call the deep, and it is the working place of all mariners. Today we are called upon to bring new life to his historic light a landmark that has kept the waters safe for all men who pass her way in the night. For over 200 years, the lights at Toro have shined their light far into the night so that mariners can return safe. We pray that this life that is relit today will continue to be a beacon on your seas and a site of safe passage to all who chart their paths her way. As he had at the groundbreaking ceremony, Congressman Gary Studs spoke of the inspiration of Cape Cod Light. Uh, the tradition here is known by everyone who has ever lived or, or breathed on this peninsula. It is a special place. The Coast Guard is a special institution. This light, while it may not save lives anymore, we're beyond that in terms of modern technology, certainly will inspire lives for many, many, many years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, the hour of nautical twilight is rapidly approaching. Mood having been set, I'm going to ask the official party to accompany Congressman Studs and Admiral Lennon to the switch that will bring Highland Light back to life. If I may ask you to assist me, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, relight the light. A six-year effort to move Cape Cod Light was now complete. It is hard to imagine that the builders of this lighthouse ever envisioned the structure being moved in such a way and with such public momentum and symbolism. Cape Cod Light has come to mean community, strength, and security, elements we all seek in our lives. As the light reaches out, we reach towards it. Here, Cape Cod Light will sit for another 200 years always a beacon of welcome and warning. It awaits a future generation to save it once again for our sakes and for the sleepless eyes, as Thoreau wrote, far out at sea. 
The lighthouse lamp a few feet distant shone full into my chamber and made it as bright as day. So I knew exactly how the highland light bore all that night and I was in no danger of being wrecked.